So this is chapter 16, respiratory emergencies. Okay. All right, so in the field, we're going to see a lot of patients. Quite often, we'll come across patients that complain of dyspnea. Dyspnea can be caused by many different conditions. And remember, dyspnea is difficulty breathing, right? And the cause of dyspnea can be very difficult to determine, right? But even without a definitive diagnosis, we can still save the patient's life. That's very important. You would have gone through the anatomy of the respiratory system. And so this is just a brief overview. You have the diaphragm, which is that muscle that it either, when it contracts, it moves down and what happens is that the rib cage moves up and out and what that happens what that does is that it increases the thoracic cavity and this happens during inhalation or inspiration right you also have the muscles of the chest walls these are really would be what would be responsible, what are responsible for pulling the, up, the, the rib cage up and out or down and in during inhalation or exhalation, respectively. Then again, you also have the accessory muscles of breathing. These muscles are not in use during normal inhalation and exhalation. Only whenever there is respiratory difficulty, you will see these muscles being used. You yeah, have the abdominal muscles that are sometimes used during these um, difficulty breathing, as well as the ones near the neck, near the collarbone. And of course, you have the nerves from, that run from the spinal cord and the brain to these muscles. The upper airway consists of all structures above the vocal cords that are involved in respiration which would include the nose and mouth the jaw the oral cavity the pharynx and the larynx and here's a very nice representation of it so here we see the pharynx the mouth the epiglottis the larynx those make up the upper airways and then we see the trachea the bronchioles the main bronchi and the alveoli those make up the lower airways Right. The principal function of the lung is respiration, which basically that respiration is really the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. All this happens is that air travels through the trachea and into the lungs, then onto the bron bronchi, which are the bigger airways, then which branches off into smaller airways called bronchioles and then the alveoli where the actual exchange of gases take place. During the respiratory process, two things happen, inspiration or inhalation and expiration or exhalation. Oxygen is provided to the blood and carbon dioxide is removed from it. In healthy lungs, this exchange of gases takes place rapidly at the level of the alveoli. All right, so here we see what happens for the diagram figure 16.2 shows us. So what happens in number the, the square or the sorry the rectangle marked number one deoxygenated blood is carried from the heart 
to the lungs by the pulmonary arteries, which then branches off into arterioles, and finally to the capillaries that are surrounding the alveoli. The carbon dioxide that is in deoxygenated blood moves across the alveolar walls and into the alveoli space. Meanwhile, oxygen leaves from out of the alveoli and into the blood capillaries. This is done by a process of diffusion. Remember, probably from high school, you would have remembered diffusion is the process by which like a gas moves from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. So in this case, the oxygen is very concentrated in the, the alveoli, and so it moves from the alveoli into the capillary, which is the blood, and then carbon dioxide from the capillaries move into the alveoli spaces. The carbon dioxide, no, you can look to three so that the drug is the, the blood is now oxygenated so oxygen in the blood is now carried from the lung and to the heart the heart then pumps this oxygenated blood to the tissues of the body the carbon dioxide that is in the alveoli will now travel back up the bronchial space and exhaled out the mouth and the nose, right? When the heart pumps this blood to the tissues of the body, the tissues use the oxygen in the presence of glucose to make energy. So the oxygen now leaves from the blood in the capillaries and into the tissues, the body tissues, and then carbon dioxide leaves from the body tissues and into the blood, the, the capillaries. And the process starts all over again. So this is the physiology of respiration. Good. Hope I didn't lose anybody. So this is basically telling you what happens. So the oxygen passes into the capillaries and then the carbon dioxide return to the lungs. Right. So The brain stem senses the level of carbon dioxide in arterial blood. If the level of carbon dioxide drops too low, then the person automatically breathes at a slower rate and less deeply. So what this does is to increase back the level of carbon dioxide. By right, the normal level of carbon dioxide in the blood should be between 23 to 29 millimoles per liter. So if it falls below 23, then the brainstem is sensitive enough to say, hey, something is not right here. I need to slow the breathing rate and I need to breathe. Sorry, I need to, I need to slow the breathe. If the levels of carbon dioxide, is, it drops too low, I need to slow the, the breathing rate and breathe less deeply. If the levels rise above what the person should have in the blood, then the person starts to breathe more rapidly. So the rate gets higher and the person breathes deeper. So you're blowing off the excess carbon dioxide. Right? The proper exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide can be hindered by a number of things. There may be abnormal or pathologic conditions in the anatomy of the airways. For example, there could be the, the, um, a disruption or a swollen swelling in the in the, the trachea or in the upper airways and this prevents oxygen from coming in and carbon dioxide from getting out. The disease, a disease process, it could be asthma, you know, suppose that the bronchioles are constricted, air cannot come out nor come in freely, as well as traumatic conditions such as um, you're, met in an, uh, you're met in a motor vehicle accident, chest hit up, 
against the steering or there's a penetrating injury which penetrated a part of the airways. There may also be abnormality in pulmonary vessels, the vessels that take the blood from the heart to the lungs. There may be a clot in there, and that's what is caused in during the proper exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide. The EMT must be able to recognize the signs and symptoms of inadequate breathing and to know what to do about it. There are some patients that have an elevated level of carbon dioxide in their arterial blood. If the levels remain elevated for a period of years and the respiratory centers in the brain don't function properly. So instead of using the carbon dioxide levels to drive breathing, like what is normal, then what happens? Then the body goes to a backup system. So instead of using the carbon dioxide level, the body drives breathing by using low oxygen levels. So in your patients like with COPD, over time, the carbon dioxide level in their body is so high that you can't depend on the primary way of regulating breathing or driving breathing. We have to now switch now. Instead of carbon dioxide level, the focus is now on low oxygen levels. As such, persons that depend on low oxygen levels to trigger or to, to drive breathing we have to be careful when administering oxygen to them because if it's low levels that drive their breathing by giving them high flow oxygen per se, then theoretically what can happen, we can either slow or totally stop respiration. Got that? It either because if they depend on a low oxygen level, in order to drive their breathing, for example, a patient with COPD, when we start giving high flow oxygen, experts are saying that this high, higher level of oxygen could stop their breathing or slow it down. So it's, it's better to err on the, on the side of caution. When we're giving oxygen to these patients, we start off with low flow oxygen. To two um, liters per minute, increasing to three, then to four, and we'll see what happens. But never withhold oxygen from somebody who really needs it though, right? This now can be caused by many, many medical problems. Oftentimes there's altered mental status, and this may be a sign that the brain is not getting enough oxygen, it's hypoxic. Patients often have difficulty breathing or hypoxia with the following medical conditions. When there's pulmonary edema, hay fever, pleural effusion, obstruction of the airway, hyperventilation syndrome, environmental or industrial exposure, carbon monoxide poisoning, or drug overdose. Right. Be aware that one or more of the following situations may exist in a patient experiencing dyspnea. One, gas exchange between the alveoli and the pulmonary circulation is obstructed by fluid in the lung, infection, or collapsed alveoli. The alveoli, two, the alveoli may be damaged and cannot transport gas properly across their own walls. Three. The air passages are obstructed by muscle spasms, as in, in asthma, mucus, as in bronchitis, or weakened or floppy airway walls. Four, blood flow to the lung is obstructed by blood clots, such as that which happens during pulmonary embolism. The pleural space may be filled with excess air or fluid, so the lungs cannot properly expand. That happens during, for example, um, plural, plural edema or pneumothorax. 
All right, so here we see the symptoms of inadequate breathing. In your textbook, this will be much, much clearer. Um, the patient reports difficulty breathing or shortness of breath. Patient has altered mental status associated with shallow or slow breathing. The adult patient appears anxious or restless, while the child appears sleepy and listless or listless. The respiratory rate is too fast or too slow. Remember, for the adults, it should be between 12 to 20. For children, 25 to, to 15 to 30, and, and infants, 25 to 50. The breathing rhythm is irregular, so it's not consistent. You have chest rise, and then it doesn't happen at, a reg at regular intervals. The skin is pale, cool, cool clammy, or cyanotic. There is adventitious breath sounds including wheezing, gurgling, snoring, croning, or stridal. Decrease or noisy breath sound are heard in one or both sides of the chest. The patient cannot speak more than a few words between breaths, you call it two or three words, this now. You observe accessory muscle use, retractions, or labored breathing. The patient has unequal or inadequate chest expansion. The patient is coughing excessively. Patient is sitting up, leaning forward with his hands or palms, flat on the bed or on the arms of a chair. This is known as the tripod position. And the patient has pursed lips, which um, in order to extend the expiration phase or nasal flaring. Patients may also complain of um, dyspnea during cardiopulmonary diseases. So it's not only restricted to respiratory conditions. Some patients experiencing diseases to do with the heart and the blood vessels, they normally can have dyspnea as well. So it's important for us to distinguish between the two, right? So patients with congestive heart failure, um, in, this condition, in this condition, the patient's heart fails to pump blood efficiently. And so it deprives the body of oxygen. So there's a buildup of fluid in the lungs, especially between the, um, in the pulmonary um, circulation between the lung and the heart. Also, some persons may be experiencing severe pain, and anytime they breathe deeply, the, whenever the rib, rib cage expands, they have really, really intense pain. So, because of that, they start to breathe shallow. All right. Infect there are certain infectious diseases that may cause dyspnea to affect um, the airways and all parts of the airways can be affected. The problem causing dyspnea is always some sort of obstruction. So there must be some sort of obstruction in the airways for dyspnea to happen. It may be mucus and fluid obstructing the airways of in the major passages such as that which happens during colds. It may be swelling of the soft tissues in the upper airways like epiglottitis or croup. We are going to go through those. There may be impaired exchange of gases in the alveoli like pneumonia. But whatever it is, we have to be diligent about using the appropriate PPEs when we're in contact with persons who we suspect have these infectious diseases. We're going to be looking at croup. Croup is inflammation and swelling of the pharynx, the larynx, and the trachea. So as when you look at the, the picture, imagine those airways being swollen and inflamed, red and swollen, right? It's typically seen in children between six months to three years old. It can happen in adults, but rarely. Because children's respiratory um, or airways are so delicate. For one, it's not as large as the adult airways. So any swelling can cause severe obstruction in the airways. 
the Allmark sign of croak, our strider, and a steel bar cuff. And I'm, at the end of the lecture, I'm going to let you listen to a child that has croak, how it sounds. You can't anything, you, you, you cannot put anything in the mouth of a child with croak. So even suctioning can cause obstruction. So you have to be very careful. Croup often responds well to the administration of humidified oxygen. Epiglottitis. If we remember from anatomy, the epiglottis is that flap that covers over the trachea when a patient is swallowing. So what happens is that in order to prevent food contents from going down into the airways, they flap or the epiglottis covers over the trachea and then the food just goes down into the esophagus and into the stomach. So imagine now this part, this flap that is that you can see right near that where, where it says swollen epiglottis. Imagine that being so swollen that it actually cuts off the airway. Right? So what usually happens is that the, the child is often found in a tripod position and drooling. You have to treat them gently. Try not to let them cry because it will make the condition worse. Position the patient comfortably, provide them with high flow oxygen, and remember, do not put anything in their mouth. We have another virus called respiratory syncytial virus. It is a common cause of illness in young children. It causes an infection in the lung and the breathing passages and leads to bronchiolitis and pneumonia. It's very contagious. We assess for signs of dehydration because it is accompanied by a severe sore throat and children don't want to eat or drink anything. And we treat with, so we treat airway and breathing problems as appropriate. All right, so bronchiolitis, which we just mentioned, viral illness that is caused by RSV and usually affects newborns and toddlers. The bronchioles become inflamed, swollen, and filled with mucus. We provide oxygen therapy and frequently reassess for signs of respiratory distress. Pneumonia. This normally refers to infection of the lungs. It's often caused by a secondary infection that begins in the upper respiratory tract, like probably, you know, you have a draining sinus or a little flu or cold, and then it develops into pneumonia. Bacterial pneumonia will come on quickly and result in high fevers, but viral pneumonia, no, it's more gradual and it's less severe. Pneumonia um, especially affects those persons that are chronically or terminally ill. So your end-stage renal failure patients, again, those that require dialysis, they, those patients normally develop pneumonia a lot. You assess temperature to determine the presence of fever and you provide airway support and supplemental oxygen. All right, pertussis or whooping cough. This is an airborne bacterial infection that mostly affect younger children under six. Um, patients will be feverish and ex exhibit a whoop sound on inspiration after the coughing attack. Again, I'll show you a person that, I'll let you listen to it, the video. It's highly contagious and is passed through a droplet infection. Watch out for signs of dehydration. Suction may be necessary. Influenza type A. This is an animal respiratory disease that actually mutated to infect humans. It's transmitted via direct contact with basal secretions and aerosolized droplets from coughing. The symptoms include fever, sore throat, muscle aches, headaches, and fatigue. It may lead to pneumonia and 
dehydration. Right, we went through COVID, similar to that, similar virus that caused the common cold, it affects the elderly, those living in close quarters with one another, with weakened immune system. Transmitted by droplets and airborne particles, respiratory deterioration may occur rapidly. Symptoms include high fever, cough, inspirational chest pain, vomiting and diarrhea, and a nose male, which is the inability, a nose male, sorry, which is the inability to smell. Tuberculosis can remain inactive for years. Patient can complain of fever, coughing, fatigue, night sweats, and weight loss. Wear gloves and eye protection as well as N95 respirator at a minimum. It's mostly prevalent in homeless people, prison inmates, nursing home residents, or persons who abuse intravenous drugs or alcohol, as well as those with HIV too. Uh, acute pulmonary edema. All right, so this happens when the heart cannot circulate blood properly, like during congestive heart failure. So what happens is that fluid builds up in the alveoli and in the lung tissue. Um, patients usually experience dyspnea with rapid shallow respirations. In severe cases, there's a pink, frothy, Sputum coming from the mouth and the nose. Not all patients with pulmonary edema though have a heart disease. So, because you can have pulmonary edema happening in patients that are cancer patients and so forth. Most patients have long standing, a long standing history of congestive heart failure though. So, what happens? The alveoli spaces become filled with fluid. Um, this separates the wall of the alveoli too from the capillary, so gaseous exchange can't take place. So see, we have the fluid in the alveoli space instead of air, which, is, which impairs the exchange of the oxygen and carbon dioxide. All right, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease called COPD. It's a lung disease characterized by chronic obstruction of lung airflow that interferes with normal breathing and is not fully reversible. It describes what is known as emphysema and chronic bronchitis. And so normally there is an interplay of both chronic bronchitis and emphysema when you talk about COPD. With chronic bronchitis, what happens is that there is excessive mucus in the small airways and the alveoli. The airways are weakened and the protective cells and lung mechanism that normally remove foreign particles from the lung that's destroyed. For example, you, you have some things in the lung that sweeps away mucus called cilia those those things are non-functional when you have the the bronchitis so you realize that persons are more susceptible to, to bacterial infection so pneumonia easily develops tobacco smoke can cause chronic bronchitis to happen so a lot of times this happens and then what it repeated, when it happens repeatedly, it causes scarring in the lung and the dilation and obstruction of the alveoli. The emphysema partner of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, what happens is that there's a loss of elastic material in the lung. So this cause, this, the cause includes inflamed airways and smoking. So as I was saying before, most patients with COPD have elements of both chronic bronchitis and emphysema. C 
So here's a figure showing the normal bronchiolar and alveolus, and then the inflamed one, so the, the middle picture is inflamed, not quite obstructed, but there's a mucus plug there, and of course, instead of being nice and smooth, the bronchiole is red or inflamed and swollen. And then the third picture shows an, an obstructed lung. The mucus plug now is completely occluding the, the bronchiole. So air is trapped in the alveoli, it's dilated because remember it's like a balloon. So it's in that dilated state, can't push the air out. Mucus is even in the alveoli, so a little bit collecting in one of, uh, one of the, the sacs and the patient cannot breathe out. This alveoli is just, this alveolus is rendered useless. All right, so remember at the outset we said that patients may have dyspnea with not only respiratory illnesses like your COPD, but they can also have symptoms that are pretty similar with patients with congestive heart failure. So in the clinical setting, how can we differentiate dyspnea that is caused by COPD as opposed to dyspnea, which is not respiratory related, but is more a cardiopulmonary problem. All right. Well, patients with pulmonary edema, which is the cardiovascular problem, the congestive heart failure problem, they normally have wet lung zones. So when you normally listen to their lung, you hear ronchi and crackles. But the patients with COPD, they normally have dry lung zones that, that, that's wheezing because, as you can see, air forcing air out of the airway is the problem with COPD. Do not assume, though, that all COPD persons will have a dry lung and all pulmonary edema patients will have a wet lung. As for example, if you would no, if you get a patient in the field, patient is on heart failure medication, has been a high blood pressure patient for a number of years. You listen to the patient's lungs and you're, you're not hearing um, any wet sounds. It may mean that the alveoli, they're so full of fluid that no bubbles, you're not hearing the bubbles, no bubbles are there to hear but they may have a wheeze because the bronchioles are so swollen that they are constricted. So you see, this patient, even though exhibiting pulmonary edema um, resulting from heart failure, is having wheeze, a wheeze. So what we can do now in the field is realize that, oh, hey, this person doesn't have asthma. So the person is having some sort of what, what some physician term cardiac asthma is not real asthma, it's asthma stemming from the failure of the heart to pump blood efficiently. In any case, always remember we treat the patient and not the lungs. So we have to look for other clues to see what's happening and do things in the best interest of our patients. All right, so asthma, a fever, anaphylaxis. Asthma, a fever, and anaphylaxis are as a result of an allergic reaction to either an inhaled, ingested, or injected substance. All right. So in asthma, what we see is an acute spasm of the smaller air passages, the bronchioles, and this is associated with excessive mucus production as well as swelling of the membrane. See, in A, you have a normal, normal bronchiole. It's wide and nice and can facilitate the passage of air. Or look at B. It is swollen. It doesn't look as smooth anymore. And even there's a mucus protruding out of the, 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 the lumen of, of, of the, the bronchiole. So this definitely will reduce the amount of space that air can move in and out of the lungs. 
Asthma usually affects children five to seven years of age, but I've seen asthma in a lot of grown people. An acute asthma attack may be caused by an allergic reaction to a specific food or some allergen. Attack may be as a result of severe emotional distress. Anybody did know that? Exercise or respiratory infection. So respiratory infection, patient of an infected sinus, mucus drains on the chest, cause asthma and cause the asthmatic, an asthmatic attack. It is in its most severe form, an allergic reaction can produce anaphylaxis, right? Asthma affects all ages, as I said, but mostly prevalent in 5 to 17. It has a characteristic wheezing, and it may be as a result of all of these things, emotional distress, response to food, a particular food, and so forth. Hay fever. Hay fever is like the common cold. Uh, it, you have runny eyes, itchy nose, runny nose, scratchy nose, stuff like that. You can be allergic to like pollens, especially when it's blossoming time and so forth. Dust mites, pet dandel. Anaphylactic reaction, it can produce severe airway swelling. Total obstruction is possible and it may be associated with widespread hives, itching, signs of shock, and signs and symptoms similar to that of asthma. The airway can swell so much that it totally becomes obstructed. So epinephrine is a treatment of choice and oxygen and antihistamines are useful. Spontaneous pneumothorax. Pneumothorax is the partial or total accumulation of air in the pleural space. Now, let me tell you about the pleural space. The pleural space is really the membrane that covers the lungs. The membrane that covers the lung is made up of two layers. There is a layer that is attached directly to the lung, which is known as the visceral pleural. And there is the, the, that what, which is attached to the chest wall, which is known as the parietal pleural. You see, in between that space, between the two layers, there is negative pressure. And what this pressure does is that it pulls on the lung. So it, 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 it allows the lung to be inflated in the chest cavity, right? So when a pneumothorax occurs, it's an accumulation of air in this space. This place, this space is not supposed to have any air. It's supposed to have just a small amount of fluid to keep the lungs flowing, you know, to let it to let it expand and contract really comfortably. But what can happen is that trauma can happen, car accident, penetrating injury, something penetrating the lung and it caused air to escape out of the lung and into the pleural space. But it may also be caused by medical conditions. And in this case, it's called a spontaneous pneumothorax. It can be as a result of you just born with a weak part of the lung and one day it just rupture and cause air to go into the pleural space. Asthmatics as well as persons with um, COPD are also at risk and more males than females are at risk of developing a spontaneous pneumothorax. So what happens um, is that it actually, see in the picture, nice parietal and, and, and um, visceral pleura, it separates because air accumulates between these layers. See, there's a big hole, there's a wound in this this lung and it, the, the space is filling with air. The, and so the, the, it pushes on the lung. So that lung is temporarily out of service. It's not going to be expanding because that pressure is preventing it from expanding and carrying out its function. When you auscultate a patient like that, the breath sounds may be absent on the affected sign side sorry 
always ensure that you don't confuse absent breath sound from normal breath sound. Absent breath sound in the ear, anything less at all. Normal, it is clear, lungs clear, breathing is normal, all right? Plural effusion. So remember we just talked about that nice two layers pl um, plural, which is the membrane covering the lung. Imagine now it's not air filling up the plural membrane, it's fluid. So actually the fluid collects in between the spaces and it, it compresses the lung and cause difficulty um, breathing. It can stem from irritation, infection, cancer, or congestive heart failure. What we usually do, um, and you will, you will realize that the breath sounds will be decreased over that area of the lung where the, the pleural effusion is, where the fluid is. Normally, we start auscultating from the base of the lung. And if we do that, we can tell just how much fluid or where the fluid has accumulated to because we won't hear where the breath sounds are decreased over that area. <clears throat> Patients will always feel better if they're sitting upright. Patients with <clears throat> dyspnea may also have mechanical obstruction. All right, so in a semi-conscious patient or an unconscious patient, the obstruction may be as a result of aspiration of vomitus or a foreign object or improper position of the head, which causes the tongue to fall back and block the airway. If the patient was eating just before the onset of dyspnea, then always consider the possibility of foreign body obstruction, All right? We are going to just finish this slide and then pick up after lunch. Here we see where in, in um, A, figure A, there is food that is occluding the upper airways and then the B, there is actually the tongue that is causing the problem. All right, so we'll pick up at one o'clock and then we should be finished in a jiffy. Have a wonderful lunch, guys.